Well, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. It is the month of August in the, I guess you would call it the long hot summer of discontent or uh, summer 2020 hashtag lockdown, whatever your preferences are for the prison bars of your choice, grab it and go. And uh, this is going to be a rocking show today because, and I really, I hate calling it a show. It's not a show. It's going to be a conversation. That's kind of what we do here. So um, the person who is with me today, um, most of you will know, and if you don't, you will by the end of this show, and we'll put up some biographical information and web links and yada, yada, all that stuff, all that good stuff, because you need to avail yourself. But uh, for the record, it's been about three years since we talked, and I want to welcome back to the show, Lada Leone. Welcome, my friend. Thanks, Randy, and thanks, everyone. It's really nice to be here, and I, you know, kind of had to, I had to uh, shuffle father time a little. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the interesting things when we were talking about that, time's speeding up. Time has sped up. So your hours, minutes, and seconds, if they seem like they've gone into hyperdrive, they, they have because of where we are in this construct called time. And Lana, I know you've talked about this. You and I kind of come at things maybe with different languaging, but at the same time, the concepts are very much the same. And they have to do with this particular slice of time that we're in. And like I pointed out, you know, we've known this since we were kids. We knew this coming in. We knew this was part of the mission. That was part of the deal. I know by 12 years old, I had a sense that I was living in that time, that time. What that meant then, I can't tell you. And over the years, I've reframed it constantly. But more and more as I matured and began to understand even the things that happened to me in my life, all the good things, all the trauma, all the everything, all of it, I realized it was a training ground for something much bigger on a scale that has been really hard to articulate. And so like you and like many of us, we've known this, we've watched it, we came to birth something into this space and time. And what that is exactly is now up to us as creators to make it so. So just a little bit of background here you do um, you do a lot of work with people counseling and training and teaching in the areas of uh, healing and um, what you call the sovereign keys. Tell me a little bit about that kind of work and how that translates out of your own background, which included your background, obviously being part of projects, having, you know, the typical childhood that, that people have when they've been marked and identified pre-birth coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I clearly had to learn the hard way. Of course. <laughs> of course you did. Like, we all did. Uh, and, um, you know, die a few times, but um, yeah. they couldn't quite keep me down. Um, so that was kind of funny. But learning what i what i did i look at it as a type of an initiation because the knowledge that i came in with have to do with the keys so that not only do we realize that this version that we are living here is not the real version this is the counterfeit version therefore the laws there are laws that are applicable to the nature of what everybody's experiencing here. And there's keys that are required to navigate through this synthetic quantum Ouroboros eternity systems machine that we're living, this, this holographic um, counterfeit reality system. So without the keys, you know, this has been the problem without the keys it, this is by nature the Ouroboros. It's a trap system. It's a labyrinth trap system that nobody's really been able to get out of. And every time 
consciousness spreads, what happens is the machine itself, if you will, with all of the parasitic demiurgic Yaldabaoth yep. energies, they continually um, upgrade the system, okay, to trap you further. So just as everybody has been expanding consciousness throughout, quote, evolution, mm -hmm. they've been expanding the machine, in essence, to trap everyone. So one of the things that um, when we came in, it is actually to dismantle this because this is the inverse. So the keys that I speak of have everything to do with that, have everything to do with the nature of the quantum reality spheres with regards to the counterfeit inversion systems that we're living in. And this includes like parallel realities. This includes astral realities. These are all counterfeit systems that, you know, are like facsimile copies of the original without keys without the knowledge and the tools to navigate through here you know what happens is that people just get recycled into deeper levels of the trap of that reality of those versions of reality so yeah. that's one of the reasons why i was allotted to have memory and i always say to people it's not for me that didn't happen for me that happened because i was meant to have it for everybody else and that's when we came in we came in with a lot of that knowledge and you spoke when you were 12 mm -hmm. that you you know you were you know there's there's the you that is living in in the 3d reality or the you know this whatever this version is then there's the you that comes in and has that knowledge so in your experience you had that and you were waiting, but you still had to live as a 12 year old. You had to still go through the stages, right? And right. merge that yeah. all together. Yeah. So I'm curious as to your experience. And maybe well, as you can. Long, you know, and all of that was compounded by the fact that I began having weird experiences at three years old. And I have memories that are that old. You know, that's something that I've related a few times on the shows. And in a private group of people in um, Arizona about five years ago. And I had somebody challenge me and say, nobody remembers being three years old. And my reply to that is I can describe the very bedroom that I was in down to the fabric of the curtains. I can describe the lighting. I can tell you what happened yeah. when I was pulled through a wall. Mm -hmm. I can tell you with very distinct detail where I was when I had abduction experiences, when I had experiences that you would call out of body. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to live through that. I had to live through the trauma of being ritually raped when I was 10 years old oh, yeah. and going through that for a year and all the other things. And, you know, when you talk about things like that, it sounds like, oh, you're such a drama queen. And I didn't talk about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that it related to what I was doing. And I realized that by containing that and never discussing it, never allowing it out, I was avoiding the experience which gave me the ability to reach into the depths of myself. So in a sense, like what you're talking about with the keys, mm -hmm. those were some of the keys that were quickened in me. And as horrible as all that sounds, there were wonderful things along the way. You know, I learned nature. I learned and understood the language of nature. Uh, you've talked about this as well, the elementals. And, mm -hmm. and Shane and I talked about this in an interview that we did last year, mm -hmm. that um, the greatest gift I got was probably the immersion into nature and beginning to understand that was as close as we could get to the authentic reality that mm -hmm. is us, that mirrors the world we came from. Exactly. That is exactly it. And that's what we are here to do and to be, because that in and of itself is dismantling this. See, the machine cannot co-opt truly an authentic energy that's come in from the original, from the real realms. Yeah, yeah. So activating these codes is obviously different for each person. So you, yep. 
you obviously have to be able to tap into somebody's energies, into their persona, their psyche, mm-hmm. and sift through all of that to come down to the strands that begin to pull out the authentic. Because everything in this world is designed as a synthesis of our authentic. So yeah. there's, there's components of me, there's parts of me that they're out there. They're, they're part of me. They're disparate. And yet at the same time, they're, they're fragments of, of synthetic parts of me that I continually have to look at. And, and finally, I have to liquidate them because they don't serve me anymore. And I, I, I see this with a lot of people. I think everybody goes through it. The more aware you become, you become more aware of those aspects of yourself. It, and it's like, I remember reading, um, who was it? The Russian, uh, the Russian philosopher from the early part of the, the 20th century. Um, this, the name just escaped me. Um, and he was talking about these synthetic selves, about these aspect selves, something I'm very aware of. Mm-hmm. And there were aspect selves, you would call them fragments, you might call them altars. Mm-hmm. I... I have my own language for this because it, some right. things are triggering mm-hmm. and I'm comfortable with that. But I'm also aware of the aspects of me that are organic mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and talking, for instance, about this, this feminine, feminine aspect that I knew from that same age, around three years old, who guide, who is my guide, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whose name is Audra, who has been with me since I was three years old. Wow. She's my voice. She's yeah. my voice that frankly has kept me from killing myself, from dying, from doing self-destructive things, and to guiding me when I need to hear. Mm-hmm. Because for some reason, that to me is my still small voice. That's the voice of, the, of my spirit, my, you know, yeah. the feminine, the Holy Spirit, whatever yeah. you want to call that. That voice comes in and it's calming. And it's lucid. And it ha- and you remember the first time when you were three. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was clear. It was and clear. it's interesting that because you, you because you say like the f- your first memory is at three, and then when you heard her voice, it's at three. So three is really significant. Well, of course it is. It's very significant. Yeah. It's a and, significant age. And so before three though, you don't do you remember anything at all? Not a little fragments and bits of things, but not much before that that's concrete. Something was quickening in that time. I started having experiences with other beings. Yeah. These beings were not, this isn't like ET abduction. Mm-hmm. These were, and I have names for them. I, I've written all this stuff. I'm kind of like you. I'm writing a book right now and, and I'm debating what do I put in? What do I leave out? What's too personal? Um, but those beings had names and those beings were teachers. They were instructors. They were not in this dimension. And I don't know how else to describe that, but I was given knowledge that was natural and I was given knowledge that was supernatural. And some of that knowledge was that language. I had a vocabulary of an adult by the time I was five years old. And I also understood Latin and fragments of other languages. Yeah. I could literally read Latin. Nobody ever taught it to me. And it was important for me, I guess, to be able to read Latin because there were texts that I was supposed to read. And so those were kind of my quickening experiences that, like the work that you do, those are the keys that sustained me. Mm-hmm. It kept pulling back through all of this trauma. And all of this bullshit that we go through, even just the basic stuff. I have the, you know, I had to, I had to bring myself to a place a lot of where I could be civil and sociable because I was so intolerant of the world, of the systems, of yeah. how it's just going to school and being socialized, of the institutions around us. My 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 family, on my father's side, they were all Freemasons, and they were very connected to politicians. 
My grandfather was a railroader who was connected to the Harriman family, which was a gateway for going into what later became Project Talent and how I wound up with my own little adventures in the underworld as well. And I don't want to make this about me, but I think representationally, I can speak to the work you do by, by saying that I understand how important it is to have these keys and to have a guide, a teacher, someone who can bring this out of you because otherwise I'm, I'm past 50. I'm, I'm way past 50. I've worked my entire life to get clarity on a lot of the things that I experienced back then. And so, you know, the value of what you do in your work is inestimable in my opinion. And so we won't talk about me anymore because we want to talk about you. But but you raise a really good point. And I just want to say, I, I want to say that I completely, this, this was one of the heartbreaking things I feel about the things that we all had to go through and the ways that we had to go through it was not having a single person to help yeah. us. We had to have celestial intervention, literally. Yes. Yep. Because there wasn't a single person who was equipped to even handle the nature, a quarter of the nature of what we had, you know, experienced on the daily. So without Audra and that voice yeah. guiding you, right, yeah. without the voice of my father, um, forget it. Just forget it. it. It would have been an impossibility. So I do... And I think that's one of the reasons why we do what we do, because we know what that was like. We know what it was like trying to um, navigate through that without any resources in terms of support or help or anybody that could even just deal. I mean, there's like, I'll just say certain experiences, right? When I would levitate in the middle of the class or in, at, at like the birthday party, I yeah. was invited. I was barely, so embarrassing. I know, right? I wasn't really invited to that many things. And I got invited to a birthday party and this is like, this will, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. But I'm just going to give that example because it was this kind of, supernatural thing supernatural is not unnatural supernatural is what's innate in us anyway um yeah it's just us being us yes. so i get invited to this birthday party i'm like completely like wow i'm actually invited to a birthday party and um because usually i was just like on the periphery completely everybody was like you're um space cadet and blah 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 <laughs> so um I'm at the birthday party thinking, how great is this? This is so super. And I guess my excitement or something, but I started levitating. And I got up to the ceiling and every time that would happen, I would freak out because I thought if I'm outside and I start levitating, I'm just going to keep going. Right. But I'm on the ceiling. All the kids are screaming and crying. Birthday party breaks up. I'm still stuck on the ceiling. Um, the girl's father has to grab a ladder and try and pull me down right but couldn't it was like that whatever the force field was nothing could get me down until it wanted until i got down so i was up there for like an hour wow literally just stuck like wow. the, to the to the ceiling so who's who back then would have been around to be like it's okay you're okay like this is what's happening that's called levitation Anything would have helped. There wasn't a single thing. Yeah. So it's a terrifying experience. Anything like just, just abuse in and of itself is terrifying for a child. Just having a parent that's neglecting you is terrifying. Just having, but you know, you put it all together and the things yeah. that we've experienced and you have nobody there. I think there is a part of us that we, we're trying to do what we can because we don't want people going through this without knowing what's going on and without having whatever they can have to be guided through it so that they don't go insane, so that they don't commit suicide, so that, you know, they don't lose faith yeah. because there's a higher hand over all of this. And although it all appears like it's all coming down, which it is in many ways, there is a huge events hand and it's benevolent. 
that is and, and exceeds all of what's happening and, and it what's happening is because of that ultimately you talk about your father's voice and i've heard you use that term before can you articulate that a little bit more well i've always uh from before birth um it's been his voice, literally the father of creation, if you will, the father's voice. Now, this is a mystery within a mystery within a mystery because the mother is within the father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the quote creator or creatoress is actually, you know, if you want to look at the way that manifestation comprehends creation, it's from the mother. Yes. But the father was always speaking to me from before birth. That was, the, that was my parent. That was my guiding force. That, that was the voice of, you know, if you will, father creator. Mm-hmm. The father yeah. creator. Not yeah. the Yal, not, not Yal de Boeth, not right. Yahweh, not Jehovah, not Demiurge, not this uh labyrinth system of counterfeiting yeah all these fake gods yeah the demiurge and yes yep yeah and we have to sit through all of that i mean (laughs) the pantheon of the gods and how that's played out many of them came to me when i was little sure right like i mean they they want to exploit your weakness of vulnerability so they didn't wait to come to me when i was an adult they were like, we're going to come to you when you're like six years old and five and seven and eight mm-hmm. and see if we can like somehow, you know, have access to you or manipulate you, exploit you in some way because you're too, you're still, you're not a child in the normal sense of a child because you come in with the information, you come in and all the knowledge and the memories and like you have not been wiped. But at the same time, this is a new kind of experience and I have to learn how to navigate it because it is so foreign to me. So I still have to go through the evolution of a child and what this is and what this reality it was all whack, right? So of course, yeah. they all decided, well, we're going to go right when she's little and she's like freaking out because of all of the paranormal stuff happening around her. So they did come to me, and this is like part of part of them knowing who we are when we come in, and that's why they all. You had all the visitations. You had both from the benevolent and also and from the, all of the exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's all there. Like it's, it's just like figuring that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they. You know, because we live in duality, we we are experiencing duality on steroids because we're hyper aware of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know what? Right. I was 11 years old. And I went to a Billy Graham rally and gave my heart to Jesus and spent years sifting through that. And when I was about 14 or 15, I went, now nah, this is bullshit. And I told my parents, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm done with this. And I studied Eastern mysticism and learned to meditate and learned to do breath work and suddenly realized that, you know, a lot of what I believed was valid it was just it was it was like those artifacts those early artifacts it was like they threw me the artifacts of creator so that i wouldn't relink back to the authentic which was always that still small voice always exactly. it's always there exactly. you know that's who audra is to me and it's just because i guess as a as a person born a male the feminine has always been the balancing for me. So that feminine balancing was the voice I heard because it was the one I would listen to. Right. Because I was a rebellious child Mm -hmm. to my father in the natural and to my father above a lot of times because all the shit we went through. I mean, that we wound up believing anything at all is a (laughs) miracle. Yeah, that's, that's, it is. It, it it really is. I mean, my heart really goes out to to everyone. I'm really proud of everybody because navigating through this, even knowing, like, with as much, and because because I came in with memory, and I, you know, it was allotted that I would come in with memory, and and 
what happens to people wouldn't happen to me, but it was really difficult by the way, for that to be the case, like for them, for the heavenly realms to have that happen was very difficult. So when I think of everybody having to navigate through this, like being washed constantly, okay, constantly mm-hmm. going, mm-hmm. being washed and recycled, rent, like it's like the washer and the dryer, like yeah, you know, yeah. this, is, this is like what's Spin been happening cycles. at yeah. infinitum, right? Yeah. That they navigate through this, which is high, can I swear on your show? No, <laughs> which is high fuckery. <laughs> it is. It is. You, no, you can. No, you feel free. So, this is... Because that's the best word I can think of. It is fuckery. I mean, so, totally. To to see the people actually getting through with as much as what they're able to do, the with how many spin cycles they've been through, and wash cycles is to me amazing. So I just have to say that, wow, really, this is something to be really proud of because you know this whole machine mind the metal god mind the parasite mind the demiurge mind the yaldaboeth mind doesn't want anybody knowing it it like throws you the black and white squares the completely contradictory stuff the you know so that you just don't even know if you can believe anything at the end of the day Mm -hmm. yeah yeah And, and truthfully that's the way they want it the oh, best look system. at this. Yeah, I that know. door I just, just opened. I know. You just... Well, oh, a door opened. A door opened. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. I was sitting there and I went, did that just... And I thought, ah, maybe it's a cat. There's no cat. There's no cat. Interesting. No. no. Wow. Well, the door is now open. We walk through the portal because something has decided it wants to enter this recording. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, in and again, to, to, to go back for a minute to what you were talking about, it's actually an act of mercy that most people do not come in with this kind of recall because of the level of trauma that has occurred in yeah. Bordeaux between lives. Um, I went through a series of not formal regressions, but in understanding who I was, I began to have memories of some of the things that happened between those lives and where, where we go, where we are, what this, what this netherworld is, this, this void, Mm -hmm. because it's a scary, dark ass place. And want out, and you will pay any price to be out. I, I remember, and it's probably why in the natural I'm somewhat claustrophobic. It's because I have this memory, and it's been replayed in the natural as well. It was part of it was part of torture. It was part of the gaslighting that I received, even as a kid in school. When they stuck me in, do you know these great big gymnastic mats that they use? They roll them out yeah. onto the floor. Yes. How heavy? Well, I was shoved into the center of one of those, and two great big guys sat on either end of it. When I was maybe thirteen or fourteen, I was terrified. I was being bullied, and it was like in that moment something, something happened, and and, and I started to understand there was something inside of me that had a deeper fear than that. I mean, obviously they left me out of it. People intervened. They saw what was going on, but it triggered a a cascade of memories where I came to understand that I had been in a dark place where I was imprisoned and it wasn't on this world. I've never talked about this before. This is, this is good. But the netherworld which is the only word I have for it, but it is technically what they call Bardot. I was not, I was not in, incarnate. Mm-hmm. I had a sense of myself as a being, as a consciousness, as a disembodiment, but without any sem- semblance of physicality. In other words, I had an awareness, a trapped awareness. And how inside you could it's like it's like that painting and i have a t-shirt with it on the silent scream 
Um, it's emblematic of the soul, which is trapped in this dark place and wants out because it wants light again. And it's like, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm -hmm. Kind of. And we don't know how long that lasts because there is no time there. Yeah. You know, probably it could have been seconds or it could have been eons. I don't know. I know that the sliver of the memory that I saw, which was triggered by these events, was enough to convince me it didn't matter. It was desolation of the soul, and I never wanted that again. Yeah. And so, there, you know, it's, it's, this is hard to, to communicate. But like I say, my point was that there's a mercy in this that yeah. people not remember. That yeah. I've had people say uh, about doing regressions and they want to remember who they were in other lives. And, and I've, I've never done regressions just because... To me, that's a sacred part that if I'm supposed to know, it'll be revealed and I have some understanding of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not all that curious about it. It doesn't really have anything to do with this. Because yeah. whatever we went through before and whoever we were culminated in the consciousness we are now. now and this is yeah. the consciousness we have to utilize. This is, yeah. this is the only one that counts. Mm -hmm. not, to, not to dismiss anybody's previous incarnations lives or what they had between lives this is what counts now that's my exactly. heart that's exactly. my heart that says you have to let all that go just as much as we have to let go the experiences that we have in this illusory mm -hmm. experience as well mm -hmm. because it's the yeah. same thing because we're not like the sum total of that no. that just got us to where we are now no. No, and that's part of that's part of the mentality that exists in this community and I've done a lot of interviews I've talked to a lot of people I have complete compassion for what people have gone through mm -hmm. yeah. people who have been in SRA people who have been MPD through projects mm -hmm. uh, people who are being electronically tortured and, and the point of it is that we extricate ourselves from whatever we can in the present moment but we don't dwell in that that's yeah. why I'm reluctant to talk about things mm -hmm. on some mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. you know, and I was, I went through therapy a few years ago and my therapist was dragging stuff out of me. And I was like, I don't want to talk about it. And she's like, well, you should talk about it. She said, this is the appropriate place to talk about it. And I had to learn that because there was, there's a part of me and it's a part of me that drives people close to me. Crazy. It's very secretive. It's a very, I hold, this dark place inside myself as, as a secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's two sides to that. There are people who are extravagant in how they expose that part of it. And there's people who are too, too covered, too concealed about it. Yeah. But the sense of that darkness only diminishes as we work in light now. Yeah. And I want to reflect this back to you and what you're doing in the work that you're doing because it's so important that there be people out there who have integrity that are doing this kind of work. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the most difficult things for people to bring to the surface the things that are hidden that are so, so painful and that are wrapped up with the stories of belief systems that have like kept you a prisoner because it's yes. keeping you from your own light. And, and this is like, this is how patterns get created. So by the same token, this is something that we've all had to face. There's no exemption. No, there's no exemption. No. <laughs> so it isn't like, well, you know, you get to go through it, but I don't, you know, I get to be, to be doing this, you have to be the living proof of having gone through it and having transmuted it and knowing what it is. Yeah. And that's, that's where the truth is. And that's a place that you get to that place through the terror of the experience and standing in that integrity of not compromising in the you know, weakest moments of your existence. Yeah. So, you know, this is just what we are 
what we are is such a complex thing here that because this is an underworld this is mm-hmm. like an absolute mm-hmm. yeah, underworld it's not you know it, the heaven is within us we are the reflection of exactly. the heaven yeah yeah so you know I, and i always say that you know there's there's a metaphysical effect that i see that we have in this synthetic machine reality because we're always we're like the anomalies here okay and no matter what the machine does we always screw it up yeah yeah and yeah. and so what we're doing is we're actually doing that and we're accelerating that even more so because the more that people get into their their power and their remembrance bringing it all together because you're this you are here as the focal point of the entire verse that you are you're literally that focal point inside a machine that can't even deal with it so we are dismantling it we are the virus we are oh, the anomalies perfect. we yeah. are the glitch in the matrix you are the virus. we're the glitches too like so look are- at the inversion there that'll bring us into what's going on now with covid and this virus meme and that they have created a contagion they call it a pandemic they engineered it they patented it they trademarked it they vectored it they made it so that it would operate on a global scale the way they wanted it to we know all this because frankly all you have to do is a little research and you can find all this stuff the patent is held by the cdc and it's on google you can look it up and you can go from there so but what they did was the genius with it was the, oh there's a virus but wait you're the virus so suddenly in an inversion of everything we understand about epidemiology and the way it's been practiced for over 100 years they took perfectly healthy people and told them they had to shelter in place a, a nice word for quarantine or lockdown which is a prison term and then they said well we understand that you may need to go out for groceries so you're going to have to wear a mask and you're going to have to stay 6 feet away from other human beings because you're infectious we presume that you are infected mm-hmm. it's like guilty before proven innocent so okay. everybody's contagion everybody's a virus carrier everybody's shedding all kinds of microorganisms off of their beingness and infecting all the other people and now we're fearful and contained and we are distanced in the 6 feet which is the field of our heart resonance away from other human beings yep exactly all by mathematical design this is down to a fine science they have this down to a fine science knowing exactly the metaphysical properties that happen when we're all together yeah yeah so in one fell swoop they've just obliterated that they've just caused the net to replace the heart wow that's so heavy yeah they did and when i began to look at this and i mean i i was i was ill a month before this thing hit with a respiratory disease I went in the hospital a few weeks before covid lockdown started i became sick on the snow moon on february 2nd i started having death visions mass death visions then i got sick and then i got sicker and i literally couldn't even walk to the bathroom anymore so as a result of that the, the short story long i went to the hospital i did not take any shots but they did treat me they treated my respiratory system i got out of the hospital i was able to walk again i began to rebuild i've been in rebuilding mode now for 8 months and 
this thing hit and I realized that it's entirely possible that what I was experiencing was vicarious, that vicariously I experienced what was about yeah. to occur yeah. on the macro level, exactly. which is weird. It's not about me, but the experience was a trigger somehow for me to be able to filter through this exactly. very quickly. Exactly. And I think we've all had that experience of empathetically absorbing the toxins that are being put into our atmosphere, mm -hmm. into our, not just the atmosphere, our air, but into our emotional bodies, into our field, into our auras, into our entire, you know, the whole five or seven body layer that we are. And that experience is a conduit for us to begin to build heart energy yeah. to continue our work. It's weird, but I kind of viewed it. It gave me compassion at a time when I was finding it hard to be compassionate. Because yeah. I, 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 there's a part of me that walks around in the world right now, and I see these dear people with what I call their amputated faces. They have masks mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. You, you can't see them anymore. They can't smile. They really can't even talk. Mm -mm. And it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to be empathetic mm -hmm. and to resonate with them because they're suffering mm -hmm. and realizing that that's part of this game too. That the way we yeah. in some ways reach people isn't going to be with words. It's going to be in the resonance of the heart as we move through this. As we're brave enough to not wear the mask Mm -hmm. And brave enough at times to even speak up, but with compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that was kind of my sense of that experience. But the other side of this is that what we're going through right now is a mass trauma event. And I know you've said that, you know, I think anybody who's been through trauma in their life understands the sequence of things mm -hmm. of how exactly. basically the first thing you do is you isolate someone. Then you traumatize them. Then you continue to traumatize them, but you don't require the initial energy that you did before because now you're reinforcing previous programming. So in a sense, the culture is going through what every person who's ever been in a program has gone through because they're being splintered and spliced and diced. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And... And it is heartbreaking because it, it happens so easily. It all just happened so easily. It was, it was so easy that those that have caused this to be placed in, in, into effect hardly had to do anything. Yeah. I mean, when I think of that, I just... I don't even have words for this because, because there's no critical thinking that, that happened in the masses. Critical thinking is asking questions, wanting proof, doing research, saying, well, is this right? But it was like nothing like that happened. It, it was just completely absorbed. Like, like what happened was some kind of an osmosis phenomenon. And it was just absorbed into the consciousness and they just like like did it you know this is actually a classic paradigm of what we knew of back in the 90s of shock and awe which was a program brought out by the rand institute in the united states it, it's it basically throws people into a convulsive state of fear because it's very sudden mm -hmm. i mean we weren't given a lot of warning I was watching the coronavirus emerge in January out of China because there were curious videos being released, some of which I think were vectored through intelligence agencies very deliberately to begin to heighten the drama. But it was very clear that there was something going on. And then we begin the gaslighting. We begin the invention of stories, which are seeded into it just like they did with 9-11.
yeah. you know, they see the stories in early. They don't hold up long, but it doesn't matter because they rely on us refreshing our memory cycles so frequently with the news cycles. So the story became, oh, the Wuhan Institute of Infectious Diseases. Apparently there was a, a wet market nearby and there was a wildlife park. And apparently this virus got into the wild and went in a vector through bats. And we wound up, and this is like the old story about AIDS. Bat, and a lot of this is deja vu for me, having experienced the, high, the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic in New York City mm -hmm. and watching my friends die yeah. from this. Right. Um, they, they've used the same models. And of course they would because Dr. Fauci was present in 1980 at NIH. So this is an old program. They've retooled. They've brought in what they learned from 9-11. Yeah. They've brought in some of the advanced technology that they now have. But at the end of the day, this is, this is really a classic program. I mean, what they're running, it's just the average person does not have the frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And after all, we're the people that they've called tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists and nut jobs and paranoid delusional and locked us up and given us Thorazine and told us we need to stay on our meds. So, you know, they don't have a frame of reference and they've rejected the prophets in the wilderness who have cried out to them, frankly. Yeah. And, and that's been the pattern. So those that have come as messengers have been rejected, have been burned at the stake, have been yes. tortured, have been, this has been like insane, insane. So, you know, this whole, and the, and the memory swiping even of the, the sequence of events mm -hmm. as per this all is just a bizarre phenomenon to me because even the, you know, when you discuss the Wuhan videos that were released at the beginning, nobody's talking about that and just how bizarre that was because that wasn't a flu. Those symptoms weren't flu symptoms. They had people literally gasping for air and falling over in the streets in some right. of these videos. And, and just like, you know, uh, being completely, what do you call it when your body's, um, like they were just dropping. Hypoxia. Yeah. Hypoxia. And yeah. this is not a, where, where is the flu related to what, what we were seeing even in that, but nobody even, it's like that never happened. No, they vaporized it. They, they disappeared. Those, those videos are gone. Yeah. You but know, it's like it never happened in the consciousness of people either because nobody's right. bringing that up either. Because they rely on the fact that the refresh cycle is short and that we only contain so much resonant memory at any given time. Yeah. You know, the old analogy of, of RAM and the computer, and once you turn the computer off, it refreshes and recycles its right. memory. Right. And humans are like that. The, the news cycle has trained us to think in very short intervals of time. Well, and I also think that there's been, um, th they have actually tweaked if you want, if you will, the quantum reality machine. Of course so that, I have. yes, yes. You know, nobody's retaining memory. It, it's like, it's even worse than it's ever been that, that now what's happening, there's no fixed point in physics anymore. There's no fixed point in memory. There's no fixed point, period. So even the Mandela effect is, is no Mandela longer. Mandela effect is the perfect example of that. And, but it's no longer at a fixed point. Now the Mandela effect is completely all also being washed and also, yeah, of course. Re, you know, it's a new, it's a new version all yeah. the time now before at least the Mandela effect stayed for a while. But right. now what we're seeing that this machine is literally like erasing, it's erasing what is authentic. It's erasing time. It's erasing your memory. It's erasing you. Like it's erasing Yes. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, um, I grew up in the area era of audio tape. So I remember audio tape machines and there was two heads, one recorded and one erased. And it's like, they've looped the tape. So you get one cycle that loops and then it erases and it records again. Totally. And the looping effect 
the shorter and shorter intervals at faster speeds, which picks up artifacts in the recording. The, mag the magnetic field retains the original images, but they're convoluted. This is like the accretion field of the planet. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're familiar with that concept mm -hmm. that Robert Monroe talked about mm -hmm. and other people have talked about it, that effectively nothing, nothing disappears. It's simply absorbed into another dimensional place and stored there, but it becomes rancorous. It becomes contaminated yeah. and we don't trust it anymore and we shouldn't. Yeah. And so the, the current cycle, which we're in now, this, this 2020 COVID era, and I, I'm going to draw us back because it was three years and eight days from this recording on uh, the 21st of August, our listeners will get it a little later, when we last spoke, on the heels of what they called the Great American Eclipse, which was that massive thing that came down through North America. And I know you've talked about it. Um, I've talked about it on the shows what I experienced, just the immense stillness of that day, how... It was weird. It was like, if, if you've ever experienced an anechoic chamber, which is used in, in projects as, as part of a torture, um, the anechoic chamber isn't just soundproof, it absorbs sound. That's what that day felt like. That day felt like everything was being absorbed into an energy wall. Coupled with the visual of what, and everybody's experience is probably different, yeah. But I will tell you that what I saw on that day in the sky were wheels shifting tracks. Yep. And I've processed this for years. I mean, I just went, why was this important? What happened that day? And it occurred to me when I was in lockdown, I sat here one day and I went, that's what this was. And the terms that came to me for understanding this, because I'm writing a book, and it's my job right now to concretize things that are abstractions in my head. I'm pulling this out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion that what shifted that day symbolically were wheels. You could even think of it like Ezekiel's wheels within the wheels. That's what I was just, kind yeah, of thing. that's what came to mind. Okay, it's yeah. a lot like that. I think that may be emblematic of what we saw. Yep. Um, but what really shifted that day were what I call the temporal substrates. We moved, and we talk about timeline shifting, and I, I always, I go, they're not lines, it's not linear, mm -hmm. we, we have to break out of linear, but what I saw in the sky and, and the languaging to me came that this, these were substrates, that what shifted was a whole dimension, Yes. in other words, the world itself, it was almost like it flipped and moved into, into you may, please yeah. help me finish this sentence. <laughs> yeah, we were taken and injected into a more densified field that was much more sophisticated in the mechanics. Yeah. And literally not just the nature of reality and the dimension, but with it, the consciousness, the mind, the body, the literal way that we interface with every aspect of it now became mechanized, literally mechanized into this densified machine wheel. And it was a wheel. And I was out there when it, when this was happening and I took photos. And so did I, but the, the photos made no sense compared to what my eyes saw. Well, my photos actually did capture some of this. Cool. And then my computer got hacked, by the way, like as soon yeah, as I put I'm them into sure the computer. Are, yeah. And, um, but it, I, and I couldn't, mind you, when I was taking the photos, I couldn't look up or anything. I was just like going crazy, hitting the button. Right? And I captured a lot. Um, but at that moment, everything everything really, really changed. And I mean, far yeah. more uh, into the synthetic mind of the beast, if you will. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we talked about it in the show we did three years ago about the metal god. 
And everything that we've seen since in this rapid acceleration of this technology, the ramp up towards quantum, the almost, I mean, I couldn't believe how fast they rolled out 5G. Yeah. It was like, that was, I've watched for years because I read the protocols for this stuff. You know, I, I've been watching internet, which is what, what's called IPv6, which is the internet of things. And the IPv6 has been out there for about seven or eight years with no implementation. And then all of a sudden we start getting this um, saber, rattle, saber rattling about 5G. And the next thing we know, we're starting to see these things going out. They're all over the place. And people are noticing that the towers are changing. And they built this thing out so rapidly, which I think, you know, obviously goes into COVID as well. And what we understand about how this high energy technology operates. I mean, every, every layer of technology that we add into this world creates a distortion level in our own body fields. But God, I mean, we're an electrical field. We're composed of water and carbon. How could we not be affected by these high, high gain electrical fields pulsing through our bodies? I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm looking out the window at the smart meter that the bastards put on my house on the one day that I was late getting home. I literally missed a truck by five minutes. Had I been here, that meter would not have gone up. I would wow. have greeted them at the door and said uh, politely, um, I would prefer not to show you my firearm right now, but you cannot put this on my house. Mm -hmm. uh, but as circumstance had it, I walked back here and saw the, the smart meter on my house, which I now have some things around it to mitigate that. But um, they've just done this. They've mechanized everything. And they're pulling us into... What, what what I call the simulacrum. I mean, it is, it is, that's exactly the word that I was going to use. They want to build, they want to build an artificial world and then invite us into it to be subsumed into it for whatever reason. Well, I think it's um, already built and it's built. Um, yeah. I think it's already um, what, what is, what, this is what we're in. This is what we're and, in. And not only that, but when that eclipse happened, and it was a very mechanical, I mean, I was going to call it a mechanical eclipse. Um, somehow, supernaturally, we see that time wasn't time anymore. And th this change in reality yeah. was just like, like overnight. Yeah. Suddenly, you have all of these towers. Suddenly, you have this. It's very Dark City. If ever, if anybody has ever seen the movie Dark City, mm -hmm. please yeah. see that movie because that is a documentary of what we're living. So in that movie, the engineers, the architects, just change reality overnight. Everything changes the whole, the whole reality itself. Yeah. Yep. They switch memories. They inject other people's memories in another person. The architecture changes so you wake up one day and it's different this is where we're at we're in dark city that's the world we're in yeah. so that mechanical eclipse is literally was the foreshadowing of this all now if we go back and i always say this some really immense huge change was in 2009 that, that actually got us to where we are now. Okay. So when, when, that, when that happened, that moment, because I'll never forget it, that moment, because I was sitting, at, I, was, I know the moment, the very second, and, and I literally knew, I was like, That's, this is actually when it's beginning. So from that point on, it just became more mechanical, more mechanical, more mechanical more synthetic uh, the the software was upgraded all the time the mm. quantum reality the yeah. the earth one earth two earth three earth four by the time we're at like where we're at right now this is just all like ghosts in the machine memories 
of what earth was, of what life was, of what memory is. Yeah, memory is permeable. We so, don't, you know, you think about your memories and you think they're fixed. And it's a scary thought because, you know, my father had dementia in his last years. And I watched as he regressed and I watched as the only memories he still had were the memories he had of maybe being a 10 year old child or a nine year old child or whatever he remembered. And when you see somebody that you've known your whole life and you realize that they've been wiped in front of your eyes, quite frankly, over the course of five years, um, you go, my God, that's, that's, it's everything that we are. I mean, what yes. do we retain from that? And you begin to question your own. And then I've gone through this. I've gone, I've sat with myself and just went, you know what? I think everything that I remembered is bullshit. I think everything I remembered is just drama. I made this up. And, and, I, and I've gone back and forth in my head. There is a resonance pattern that you come to recognize that is what we call truth. Yeah. But even that's being convoluted in this machine now. Yeah, absolutely. When you describe, uh, the, dementia is kind of how I feel that th this is where we're kind of at here in the machine. It, it is like basically a, a case of causing people to lose their minds, yeah. literally. But when I see that dynamic, when I see that energy and, and watch somebody lose their mind, I couple it like you were you were saying you had that experience of being in that um, that dark void, that dark void. Yeah. And I remember also being inserted in a dark void when I was um, in grade school in the middle of recess. And it was not the deep. The deep is a positive place yes. it's where we come in origin. Yes. But the dark void is like the terrifying soul destroyer place. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's not, death would be nice. Death is a nice experience compared to that. But dementia reminds me of that. Losing the mind reminds me of the dark void. It's, well, it's, it has a soul... I mean, just in the, in the feeling when you're a conscious being, it has a soul destroying feel to it. Yes. Yep. Very much so. And I think it's, it's to me, I mean, it shouldn't happen. That should just not exist in what we are as a being ever. So for that to be caused in this machine and of course we know it's because of the machine it's because of the washing cycles it's because over time the trauma has worn people down lifetime after lifetime to the point where their essence has been diminished and in that diminishing eventually they don't know who they are or they've lived a life where they're still kind of lost something happens something to cause that and it's suffering and it's trauma and it's pain and it's buried. You know, usually it's just like, it's a mountain of things that are buried and too painful to go near. It's like Voltaire, wasn't it Voltaire that said, um, uh, ignorance is bliss? It might have been, it sounds like, yeah, could, yeah. I mean, it is a, in one sense, you would say that, yeah. Right. But it's almost like at some point, a mind will go there and choose that because it just can't deal. And honestly, I think, I think that whatever reality is here, you know, it just, anybody, I just, it doesn't make any sense at all. The way we experience reality doesn't make sense. It is just a memory. It's a memory. It's, it's based off of a memory of original prime creation. Yet, like, everybody was thefted from that. Everybody was stolen from being able yes. to experience it. Yes. Yep. So maybe because we, we, we're, we're pretty much on an hour here. And you talked about, you mentioned the deep, and I really like that because the imagery that comes from that is something I really embrace. Because we've talked about the counterfeit so much, mm -hmm. and we've talked about how we have been 
processed through this manufactured state, so to speak. But there is an authentic, and, and you know, we have to work through this collectively now. And I would like to think that there are guides, higher guides, there are people who work like you do in this field, uh, you know, to what degree I do, others that we are trying to guide humanity. And I mean, we're a tiny sliver of a fraction of the population, whatever the population of this world is. It's not 7 billion people either, by the way. So you, and that's another thing. I mean, we've got cutouts, we've got sprites, we've got NPCs, whatever you want to call them, running as background figures. So, you know, it's, it's a dizzying array of reality, but there is an authentic in all yeah. of this. Can you articulate a bit more of how, what's the resonance pattern that we need to learn? What's the harmonic we need to resonate to? Whatever that looks like to you. I just over-verbalized. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I think I know what you're saying. Um, so the design of this obviously is to um, basically overstimulate the primes and the reels so that they become immersed in the backdrop reality version and they lose the sense of their, quote, spirit and the voice of God, the voice of the father and the mother and the original heaven that comes from within. That's what this is for. But the more that people resist the false narratives of a personality in life and whatever they think the life is, and they center in the knowledge of their prime original creation, because it comes from within, it's original, it's, it's authentic. And I'm gonna tell you the difference. Authentic energy, there's an eternal, unending power that doesn't ever stop. And it creates, it's creative, it's alive, it feels, it expresses what it feels. Yes. And it comes from an original point. It doesn't need to mimic something. It doesn't need to be shown something. And then, you know, oh, that, see, when, when an original looks and recognizes something it's because it's already in there that's the point of recognition mm -hmm. so there's the difference it's not mimicking so you know you look at a prime in a reel and you give them some information they can ah uh, it's immediate you recognize where it comes from recognize that it's authentic because it matches their authentic being and their creator so it just connects that ability to recognize in an instant is a part of what we have to lock in even more because you know you're going to be following the true sense of what you are we're bringing essentially okay we are we are the glitch in the matrix we're dismantling the matrix by bringing heaven here yes, when yes, we bring heaven yes. here we're bringing everything that is original in prime creation yep Okay, and the machine can't handle that. It doesn't matter how you look at it. It can't handle, it will never handle it. It can't handle us. That's why it has to create a backdrop reality. So as soon as people understand that they have the power that they do, and that power is an eternal source that never runs out, unlike the machine that is here, it doesn't have a connection to source. It is getting that connection to keep going through the primes and the reels. That's how it keeps going. That's why it's invested in keeping the primes and the reels exactly where they are and has been for eons. So that's, that's the trick. Once you realize that you are, you are that which cannot be co-opted, not really. That was an agreement. You agree to the terms. All this backdrop reality has to do is give you the setting and the stimulation to convince you to live a narrative it wants you so that you imprison you. But there is no imprisonment, really. The, the, what we ha Look, if I can levitate and be on the ceiling as a kid, trust me, we can yeah. break every aspect of the machine down until it's dust. Okay? And that's what we're here to do. So prime original creation, we are heaven. Wherever we are, it doesn't matter. Like, 
you know, I don't want people getting afraid of the machine and afraid of this all because what we are blows everything out of the water. It doesn't matter. They can't keep you in yeah. anything without your will. So it's really just busting through the illusions so that you know you're not captive and you can get out. Have that faith of what you are. You are the original heaven. Yes. And see, that's why, despite all the trillions and trillions of dollars they've spent, the thousands of man hours of lifetimes that they've expended, the projects failed. The technology isn't as good as they think it is. You know, it's why Project Looking Glass failed. We, you know, when we've said this a couple times. When we came in, we were the sand and the gears in these projects. We were the ones that went in there, went through it, ate shit, and came out and survived and were able to live to tell the story that they didn't want told, despite all their best efforts. And that's for everybody out there that has spoken their truth about these things. The tiny little pieces of truth that you hear that are dropped into the conversations are viral. They're viral in the subconscious and the words, the vibrations, the energies that come off of people who are speaking this are invading the field and it's really pissing them off. It's why they have to do an, a, a, an operation like Corona. Th oh, they're yeah. desperate. Right, it was interesting, the timing of it, because the, yeah. the, the sense of it, right, the sense was so palpable that they were really at a loss because it was so exponential. Consciousness was expanding yes. at such an exponential level that people were getting it. They were like, they were like communicating with the elementals. They were changing, you know, people were out there and, and they were like shifting things by will and consciousness alone. So this is the level that happens when we are all a collective in this expansive acceleration is so powerful that, you know, I, I just, it was almost like, well, we better do it now. So we better just shut this down now because they're getting too powerful. But, you know, at the same time, also, I do know that the trinary is coming in. I do know that the system is, is here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that things are coming on that front. But again, that has to do with the father's hand in this all. And what's really what this is to tear all this down. Yeah. For, I mean, tear it down for all time because this has been going on at it's infinitum. Been on, yeah, it's been going on for a long time. This is the rebellion yeah. that needs to finally be put down. So, yeah. And here we are, the angels that are invading the matrix. Mm -hmm. We're doing it. That's, uh, you know, that's a good place to wrap it because it's upbeat, it's positive for hour one. We're going to come back with a special segment for the patrons. And I want to thank you, Lada, for coming on. You folks on YouTube will hear this. If you'd like to hear more, you can go over to patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. That's my support base that's helping me to do this and to hopefully get this book written timely. And Lada, tell people where they can find you. Uh, so my website is Sovereign Keys uh, or SovereignKey.com, which is um, Sovereign, the word, and then K-I, Key.com. And uh, the YouTube is also Sovereign Key, um, K-I. And my email is Sovereign Keys with a K-E-E-S. So uh, at gmail.com and also MetaKeyKinetics at gmail.com. And you can find this on the YouTube the emails are all there um, for everyone. The information will also be down below the little box there, so you can just jump down there and grab it. All right, we're going to wrap it for this side. We'll see you on the other side if you're with us, and otherwise the truth is out there. It's inside you. Please access memory now. Yeah. This is Off Planet Radio. Thank you.